You formed the mountains by your power and armed yourself with mighty strength. You quieted the raging oceans with their pounding waves and silenced the shouting of the nations. Those who live at the ends of the earth stand in awe of your wonders. From where the sun rises to where it sets, you inspire shouts of joy. You take care of the earth and water it, making it rich and fertile. The river of God has plenty of water. It provides a bountiful harvest of grain, for you have ordered it to do so. You drench the plowed ground with rain, melting the clods and leveling the ridges. You soften the earth with showers and bless its abundant crops. You crown the year with bountiful harvest, even the hard pathways overflow with abundance. The grasslands of the wilderness become a lush pasture and the hillsides blossom with joy. The meadows are clothed with flocks of sheep and the valleys are carpeted with grain. They all shout and sing for joy. Hey everyone, I'm so glad you could join us today and I'm so glad that you are with us as we are continuing on in our series, The Big Story. I just have a couple of quick announcements for you. First, just to let you know, at the end of this message, we are going to be celebrating the Lord's table together. I know some of you, you know, for whatever reason, aren't able to join us live yet. And so I just want to celebrate that with you and let you share in that. So if you want to pause this video right now and go and get a piece of bread or cracker and some juice or some wine or whatever it is you have around the house, go ahead and pause this video right now. One more announcement before we get started is that at the end of this month, we have a very special opportunity as a church to reach out into the community on Halloween night. It's our tailgate trick or treat, and you can either participate and be there and create conversation with people in the community, or you can donate candy as well to this event. And you can do both of those things on our website. Just go to our website, find tailgate trick or treat and sign up for that. That would be so great. Okay. You ready? Here we go. Now, do you believe that Big Brother is watching? Do you? Some of you would say yes, and some of you might say no, and some of you are now asking, who's Big Brother? Well, I don't know if Big Brother is watching, but I do know that Google Maps is watching me. Because every month, and maybe you get this too, they send me a display, a map of all the places I'd been to in that month. They know all the places I've been. They're tracking me. And in one picture, I get a glimpse into my past. And I go, when was, oh right, I did go to that place, you know? And so it's a reminder in this one picture of the past uh, month. And we are continuing, as I said earlier, in our big story series. And right now we are looking at symbols. We're in fact, we're going to be looking at symbols this week and next week. And the Bible is full of symbols. And for those of you who are English teachers, I'm using that word very loosely uh, to mean anything from metaphors, icons, illustrations, allegories, anything that represents something else. Now, you remember that this whole series, the big story, started off with a question I had. Why does God care so much about sex? And a discussion about symbols is very important to answering that question. Today, we're going to look at symbols that remind, symbols in the rearview mirror. So, let's get started. And I think remembering is really important, which is why on Facebook, there's even a function you can choose on Facebook so that it pops up all your posts on that date, going back as far as you've been on Facebook. And it's sort of like going back into your history. And for those of you who aren't on Facebook, you might do the same thing, but using a scrapbook or a photo album, it's going down memory lane. I remember when I was a kid, I'd go down memory lane by collecting rocks. That's right. I'd collect a rock from the different places I'd been to, a city, 
a lake, a river, some location, a relative's house, and take a rock from there and take it home with me. And it's a little reminder of that time that I was there. And, you know, as a kid, rocks are great, they're plentiful, and you don't pay for them. But it was a little souvenir, a little memento to remind me of something else. We love symbols as human beings. One of the most common symbols is the wedding ring. It's to remind us, for those who are married, of the promises that were made on that particular day. Church buildings before the advent of the printing press had a lot of symbols involved. Some churches would employ stained glass, paintings, sculptures, decorations, even the architecture itself. Some uh, churches were built in the shape of a cross, obviously symbolic. And in one picture, stained glass, for example, in one picture, you could get an entire story. Just represents so much. And we love symbols in our culture, don't we? Here's, here's one, envy. Green is symbolic of envy. It can also, these days, mean environmental concerns as well. But for the longest time, green was about envy. Snakes represented evil. Hearts represented love. Doves represented peace. And four-leaf clovers represented good luck. They're all symbolic. And we love, and we know these symbols. They just, we don't even think about them. We just kind of accept them as is. When Jesus spoke of the kingdom, he used different pictures, different symbols for the kingdom. He spoke about a pearl, a mustard seed, a banquet, treasure. And when he talked about us, he used pictures like lamps and coins, sheep, children, managers, and seeds. And, and none of these pictures were really capturing the whole story, just part of it. Now, what's the point? I mean, what's the point of all this? Well, here's the point. God values and uses symbols in his word like an artist, like a, like a writer, like, like a playwright. And we do too. Our draw towards symbolism, I think, comes from our creator. We were made in his image. We reflect back to creation and to each other God's character. And our fascination and use of symbols is an echo trace back to our origin. So today, looking at symbols in the rearview mirror, we are going to see how symbols help make things real. They remind us. They comfort us and they teach us. One more time, they make things real, they remind us, they comfort us, and they teach us. Okay, let's, let's dive in. So symbols, first of all, make things real. And I want to look at a passage that you may be familiar with. It's from Paul's letter to the Romans. In the very first chapter, he talks about creation and he says, People know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Now, I realize calling all of nature a symbol is a bit of a stretch, but here's Paul saying that how can we see the invisible God? How can we see his power? How can we see his sovereignty? And he's saying, look around. Look all around you. Look at the trees. Look at the beauty of creation, the harmony in creation. Look at the intricate design of life itself, right down to DNA codes with, with billions of letters placed in the exact right order. How about, you know, you look at the tides and how they bring life continually back to the oceans. Take a look at the distance the earth is from the sun, that we are just the right distance to be warm but not get cooked. And all of this works together to make complex life possible. 
And in the same chapter, Paul says some people miss that symbolism. They miss that picture. And for some, they actually worship creation instead of worshiping the one who created everything. But creation is a signpost. It points us back to an infinitely powerful and wise being. You know, many of us have friends who may not be followers of Jesus, but they love to spend time in nature, don't they? They love to get in the great outdoors. And why is that? Why is it that people love to be in the great outdoors? Could it be because they love being in the signpost that is back to God? They're connecting with something that's larger than themselves and even larger than creation itself. See, symbols make things real. Creation allows the intangible God, in some ways, his characteristics to become tangible, his invisibility to become visible. So they make things real. Second thing, symbols are meant to remind. We already talked about wedding bands. We talked about my rock collection. But here's a symbol that's meant to remind that if you're a follower of Jesus, you are already familiar with. And here it is in scripture. I'll let me read it to you. Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Jesus brought us into what kind of looks like a play of some kind. And he's using symbols in this play. These symbols are meant to remind us of several things. They're meant to remind us of the price that was paid. You know, uh, wine spilled out, bread broken. There's, there's a price that was to be paid for our salvation. And also, because these were such common things in those days, it's also symbolic of the invitation to all people that anyone can come and participate in, in this. It, 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 the Lord's table is welcome to anyone who wants a relationship with God. And the idea that we take these symbols and we consume them, they become part of us, is also symbolic of the fact that God becomes part of us when we become his follower. And he becomes our sustainer, our everything. He becomes our food and our drink. And the very fact that these symbols, you know, come from one loaf and one cup is symbolic of the unity that Jesus wants in his church. The oneness, which is one of the reasons that we have in our live services been participating in the Lord's table every week because there's so much pressure on the church right now regarding COVID to divide and splinter. And that's why we have been celebrating the oneness uh, play, the oneness ceremony, the oneness symbol over and over again. So that's one symbol. Baptism is another symbol. And it's amazing as much as, you know, the church worldwide is, is divided in a lot of minor issues, the Lord's table and baptism are something that almost every church around the globe participates in. They're such powerful symbols. Now, before Jesus, baptism was a symbol of washing away sin. And, you know, in the Old Testament covenant with with the sacrifices and all that sort of thing, washing with water was a very common thing to do. It was very symbolic. But after Jesus, baptism took on a whole new symbolism. Here we go. This is Paul writing to the church in Rome. He says, Have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. So baptism, when we go under the water, is symbolic of going under the earth. We are dying. We are, we are essentially dead to, to this world's value system. 
And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we may live new lives. When we come up out of the water, it's symbolic of rising to new life, a new beginning, a new birth. It's a symbolic play, death to the old self. It's a signpost pointing us back to an event that's already happened internally. Something that's, that's already happened inside of us. This rebirth that Jesus talked about, being born again. This is, this is now played out by being dunked under the water in, in a public display. Now, you might say, hold on, you are making way too big a case for symbols. I mean, do, do human beings really care that much about symbols? Well, I mean, all you have to do is look at the news these days to see there is a great deal of interest in the symbols around us. Statues, names on buildings, what art. It's, the question today is not whether symbols reflect and remind us of the past. It's what symbols should be used to remind us of what past. After World War I, Germany lost that war, as you might recall. And there was an armistice that was signed on November 11th, 1918. And it was signed in the Campania Forest in something called the Campania Wagon, which was just basically a, a railroad cart. And that's, that's where they signed this armistice. This became a mark of shame for the German people. They saw that place, that cart, as a time of failure, a time of disgrace. So decades later, when Germany invaded France in World War II and new paperwork was signed, papers of victory, guess where Hitler wanted to sign those papers? That's right. In that exact location, he actually moved that train car from its location, put it in the exact same spot. Why? because it was all symbolic. This was righting a wrong. This was bringing honor from disgrace. Do we love symbols? Oh yeah, we love symbols. So number three, symbols comfort. Symbols comfort. Did you know that the cross, which we often associate with Christianity, wasn't actually a symbol of our faith until the second century. For the longest time, the cross was seen as just plain gruesome and humiliating and a painful way to die. But the cross eventually became symbolic of the price that was paid for sin and that the forces of darkness were defeated. It pointed back to uh, an event, but it grew into something else. It grew into a symbol that showed us how far God is willing to go to save us. It showed us the immensity of his love. John wrote to the church. He, he said, we know what real love is because. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. When you look at the cross, that is real love. And so today, people carry the cross as, as a symbol, sometimes around their neck, sometimes it's you know, dangling from their rear view mirror, sometimes it's, a, it's on their wall in the kitchen. And for some, it's just a decoration, but for others, it's much more. It's, it's so that when you maybe have a bad day or you're, you're criticized or you feel abandoned or you get bad news or nothing's going right, you look at that symbol and it's a comfort. That symbol comforts us. It, it, it tells us of God's love, of how God is passionate about us and wants us with him. It brings us great comfort in these times of trouble. We look at that and go, right, God loves me. It's a powerful symbol. And number four, symbols teach. Today, without a doubt, poems teach, songs teach, stories teach. Without, a, without any question, C.S. Lewis, when he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, wanted to teach us something about the gospel message, as did J.R.R. Tolkien in his Lord of the Rings series. 
Now, you might say, well, it's a bit of a stretch to call a story a symbol, but it is a signpost that is teaching us something greater than simply kids wandering into a magic closet or a ring that needs liquefying. It's something far bigger than those things. And here's a biblical example of, of one of these symbols that teach. Remember the Hebrews in the desert? They had just left Egypt. They just left slavery. And they got a case of the munchies. You know, there wasn't a 7-Eleven in the desert in those days. So God supplied them manna. And when God did this, the Hebrew people thought, oh, well, God's just feeding us. This is great. They thought God was just feeding their stomachs, but God had something far more elaborate in mind. This is what we read in Deuteronomy 8. God humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it. Why? Why did he do it? He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Imagine this. God used manna as a teaching tool, not chalk, not a whiteboard, not a computer. He actually used food as a symbol to teach it was symbolic of God's word, God's instructions, how much we need God's instructions, how we're energized by them, how we remain healthy because of them. And there's so much more that could be said about symbols in the Bible. In fact, I spent a whole series on this earlier this year on Breakfast at Tracy's regarding symbols. And if you're more and if you're interested in learning more about some of the symbols that are used in the Bible, I'd suggest you check that out. But now why? Why are, use all these symbols? Why does God use these symbols? Why does God use symbols that make things real and remind us and comfort us and, teaches and teach us? Is it perhaps he's telling us something about remembering? Maybe in looking to the past, he's telling us something about himself. I mean, after all, God is the master memory. He is the hard drive of the universe. Here's the reality. No one is going to speak your name or my name in a hundred years. No one's going to remember us except for one. One will remember us long after our children and our grandchildren, if we have any, stop talking about us long after our friends are gone long after our co-workers have forgotten us god does not it's one of the great comforts for for those of us who may be fearing uh dementia or even experiencing dementia right now there's that fear of being forgotten but we are never forgotten by god God always remembers us. You might recall the famous words by philosopher Rene Descartes, who said, I think, therefore I am. Very famous. You probably heard that. So I know I exist because I think. Well, John Swinton came along and he said, yeah, I don't like that that much. Here's what I think. We are because God sustains us in his memory. God sustains us in his memory. I like that. After World War I in Britain, they had to determine how to identify the soldiers that no one knew who they were. You know, what do you put on their, on their gravestones? These, these soldiers that are maybe you know, just unidentifiable. No one knew who they, who they were. What do you put on their grave marker? Well, it was suggested by Rudyard Kipling, who is a member of the Imperial War Graves Commission. He said, we should put three words on each of their gravestones. You know what those three words were? He said, write, known unto God. Known unto God. 
And it gave that soldier, that human being, a significance, an identity that would have otherwise been denied. If you pay attention in, in the Bible, as you read, it says, God remembered and so. God remembered and so. God remembered Noah. God remembered Rachel. God remembered his covenant. God remembered and so he acted. And he will remember you as well. He is the master memory. God is not a God that forgets, and he calls his people to not forget. And he uses symbols to make things real, to remind us, to comfort us, and to teach us. He loves using symbols like a storyteller. And he uses symbols in the big story. You have to understand symbols and appreciate symbols in order to understand and appreciate what is written in the Bible. And next week, we're going to look at symbols that help us see what's coming down the road. And I hope that you will join us for that as we continue looking at symbols in the Bible. Now, we're about to go and celebrate very appropriately this, these, these symbols that Jesus gave us to remember at the Lord's table. And as much as we know that symbols make things real and they remind us and they comfort us and they teach us and this is how it works at the Lord's table these symbols the the bread symbolizing his body the juice symbolizing his blood makes things real by showing us that this is an event in history it's tangible it reminds us of the victory that Jesus won. It's meant to comfort us by showing us God's incredible love for us. And it's to teach us that forgiveness has a cost. So when you take that bread, remember his broken body. Come and remember with me. And when you take the juice or the wine, remember his spilled blood and remember that your forgiveness is a gift. This is done for you. Take and drink. Lord, we thank you for these symbols. We thank you that this reminds us, comforts us, and teaches us, and makes things real to us. Lord, may this time remind us of your great love and comfort us in that. May this, these symbols continue to unify us as a church to love you and love each other. Even in the midst of all the things that want to tear us apart, Lord, may we be unified because of these symbols. All of us needing that broken body all of us needing that spilled blood. We love you, Lord. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for rescuing us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, everyone. See you next week.